Hey everybody, welcome back to the Not Just Politics podcast. We hope everyone had a great break, a nice holiday with friends and family. We certainly did. And then I got COVID, so that's why there's been a week <laughs> break in the uploads. We apologize for that, but now we're back in the studio for episodes every week. The following is a conversation with Trevor Fitzsimmons. He is the recording secretary for the Student Government Association at Point Park University, as well as the founder and president of the Shalom Club at PPU, which is a Jewish organization on campus. We sat down to talk about his radio show at WPPJ, which he also hosts, his club that he started, and his work at SGA, and a little bit of politics as well. So hope you enjoy that. If you'd like to support the show, check out the links for our social medias in the description. Enjoy. How's it going, man? Good, <clears throat> good. I saw you, you took a trip to Jamaica. Yes. Was yes, that over uh, break? Yes, I went to Montego Bay, Jamaica with my uh, mom and twin brother. Awesome. How was that? That was fun, real fun. Yeah, it looked really nice. And then you posted from your radio show, Jamaica with Love. Yeah, from Jamaica with Love. That, <laughs> you were that, actually that was from the, Jamaica. That, yeah, that was a caption I used, from Jamaica it was. with Love. Yeah, on the actual post. That was really cool, though. It looked really nice. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, you're still running that show? Yeah. Uh, Saturday. This time it's Saturdays Okay. from uh, 2 to 4 p.m. And that's over at WPPJ. How, yes. how can people go listen to that? Um, well, you can either go on the WPPJ website and stream the show live there, or you can uh, go to the TuneIn app and... Uh, Type in WPPJ and listen there. And then for my show, I have a website that I have all the past shows on. I mean, I still have to update the website. I've been a little behind on doing that. But yeah. when I update it, you have, if you miss a show, you can always listen there. I record all my radio shows while I do them in the studio. Okay, great. And is there a, is there anything on Spotify? Uh, I don't think there's anything on Spotify. Okay, for that. gotcha. Um, and how, how did you get into, because it's, uh, it's reggae music, yes? Um, yes, yes, contemporary and classic uh, gotcha. reggae music. Gotcha, okay. And how'd um, you get into that? I got into that because, um, well, for starters, I uh, did Rockathon my freshman year, and mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I obviously couldn't play, at the time, my favorite music was like, old style 90s hip hop you know Tupac yeah. Biggie Smalls yeah. obviously I can't play that because there's some explicit language in yeah. there but uh, so for the Rockathon I did uh, a two secondary types of music at the time uh, classic rock and mm -hmm. uh, reggae but you know everyone when I my sophomore year when I decided to do a show I thought about doing that concept mm -hmm. but I was like, everyone on like every radio station plays classic rock music. Yeah. That's not original. No. So I ditched the classic rock, went full reggae, and ever since I've like, it's now my number one favorite music. I listen to it all the time. Yeah, it's it's really cool music though. And that's, mm -hmm. I think that's really cool that you found that. Especially here, I think. I don't know of any other radio shows that play just reggae. Mm -hmm. so that's cool. You filled that little gap in the... Music that yeah. people were getting. That's what I was trying to do as well. Yeah, and I, you also you also started a club, mm -hmm. which is called Shalom PPU. Um, it's actually just called Shalom. Shalom. Okay. It's the uh, Hebrew word for uh, peace. It also means hello, goodbye. Translation is like come with peace or leave with peace. So that's where you get the hello and goodbye. But it mainly means like peace or whatnot. And what's the what's the goal you have for that club? Um, the goal for Shalom is to create a is to have a Jewish organ, student Jewish organization on campus that is a safe space for Jewish and non-Jewish students on campus to better promote uh, tolerance and acceptance for all people here at Point Park and uh, in the country and in the world. I love that. Um, were you... So are, are you Jewish yourself? Yes. Okay. Yes, my mom is Jewish. Gotcha. Um... Can you, I don't want to dive into this too deeply, but um, you obviously saw all the stuff that happened with, with Kanye. Yeah. Um, that was pretty troubling for me mm -hmm. to hear. And he wasn't talking about a group that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. What was that like? You know, how, how scary was that for you? Um, 
pretty scary because a lot of people listen to Kanye, like what he says or whatnot. And I feel like uh, maybe he does have some mental stuff going on, but there's no there's no excuse for the stuff he said. Like saying no, I don't that, think like, so. Hitler was good. That, there's no excuse for that. There's, no. there's pure hatred, and there's mm-hmm. no tolerance for that. But uh, he, uh, well, what was I gonna say the. I don't really listen to his music that much or, like, follow what he does, but, mm-hmm. like, just to see how, like, people react to what he's saying. And, like, I feel like the white supremacists are going to start using him for the, like for their benefit. Like, oh, we got this uh, African-American that's on our side. Right. And that, that's very scary. Yeah, that is. I think you already saw a little bit of that happening. There was that group that held up the sign above the uh, highway in Los Angeles that said, like, Kanye was right on it and stuff like that. So that stuff already happened as soon as he made those comments. There were already people that were latching onto it. And it's scary, especially to hear that it happened in Los Angeles, because I have a cousin that actually works in Los Angeles. He's, like, an agent in Los uh-huh. Angeles. And, like, do you think that there was... Because I, I saw people accusing uh, mainly... Uh, Fox News for sort of manipulating him, like for their own personal gain, by having him on Tucker Carlson's show. Do you feel like that was a thing? Because I'm not sure. Like, are they just highlighting it, or do you think that they were really trying to, like you said, use him to say, like, oh, this guy, look, he's he's not he's not that crazy though. Because look at all this reasonable stuff he's saying. I think a little bit of both. I mean, mm. important on what he said and. Uh... I mean, you know, like the 24-hour news services, Fox News, CNN, M- MSNBC, they all have their own specific agenda in yeah. addition to reporting, like, the news. Like, they report the news for, like, five minutes, and then they go off on, like, their agenda or whatnot. Yeah, like, I, I heard... usually their interviews of people or whatnot. Yeah, it was like that... Um... There there was a, a, a journalist on, on YouTube that recently got a documentary with... HBO's name is Andrew Callahan, and he made a point that um, the 24-hour news cycle at this point is more uh, punditry than it is actual news. Yeah. It's just talking heads Mm -hmm. screaming at each other, telling us how we should feel about a certain issue. It's not actually them reporting on the news anymore. It's not, and I don't think it's been for for a while. No, I I don't think so I think that's how they were all, like, I mean, Fox News is specific. I hate to, like, just go to Fox News immediately, but Fox News... I know for a fact was founded as like a conservative outlet. Yeah. Like I don't know if CNN was like strictly founded or MSNBC was strictly founded as like a liberal or like democratic outlet. But I know that Fox News was like for sure. They're, yeah, like, Fox was. I they, don't they know. They were founded as like we're going to present the news in this conservative way. Yeah, I don't know about. I don't know if CNN and MSNBC were like. I feel that. like they just s- s- swayed that way over time. Yeah. Now, do you think that was potentially as a reaction to what Fox News was doing? Maybe, because uh, Barack Obama helped Fox News a lot. Um, Yeah. Fox News wasn't really that well-known, wasn't really that popular before Obama was elected president. Mm -hmm. Once Obama was elected president, Fox News just went off, criticizing him at every turn, just like the, which was actually the strategy of the Republican Party at the time, Mm -hmm. was to just say no to everything Obama wanted to do because they thought I watched this one documentary about like uh, political divide and they Mm -hmm. used like Obama getting elected as part of the starting point because of the mass amount of people that showed up to his inauguration in 2008 yeah the Republican Party was like we might not be able to get a candidate elected again so we gotta strongly denounce this president and just say no to everything say no to to everything he says and Mm -hmm. I think Fox News also, well, I think they had their own thing going on, but they they just criticized him and they got a lot of ratings. And I think all the other like liberal outlets caught on and decided to do the exact same thing, but the other way around. Yeah, because I think Tucker is Tucker Carlson is still the most viewed show in that whatever you want to call it, the legacy media, the mainstream yeah. media. He still has the most views out of anybody. Mm-hmm. It's all about the viewers. It's all about the ratings. Yeah, I think yeah, I think Tucker actually has more like more Democrats watch Tucker than Democrats watch CNN, mm-hmm. which is wild. 
And I don't really know why that is. I don't know. Sometimes they have, like, when I was in D.C., they had, like, uh, some of the offices, they have, like, three or four TVs. Yeah. Like in the senators or... Because uh, a couple years ago, I went to lobby in uh, then-representative... Uh, what it? was... Uh, Slaughter, Louis Slaughter, mm -hmm. former representative Louis Slaughter from Rochester, New York. And uh, she had like three TVs in her office. Now, all of them were having M MSNBC on them, but I could see some politicians having like one of like each of the big three on mm -hmm. to see like what everyone's talking about. You to see if they're on there and then they got to go do some PR. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be what it was for them. Mm hmm yeah, or or, or they're or they're just sitting there like making phone calls. Like, hey, did you think maybe they want to be talked about? Maybe. Like, maybe, maybe the Republican elected officials are wanting their airtime on Fox News, and mm -hmm. the Democrats want their airtime on CNN. Well, for sure, power is like a big motivator in Washington. Oh, yeah. That's why you got all these eighty-year-olds. Some of them were segregationists back in like the '60s. <laughs> yeah. Still, still in Congress. They're still around. Yeah, that's it's why. It's not about the money. It's about the power. I mean, the money's good, but I think it's more about the power. Yeah, and then power gets you money as well. Yes. So that's just all it is. Yeah, well, that's that's why like the one thing that I I I hear these people like denying that there is a political establishment, and I I just all I can think about is the eighty year olds that have been in Congress for twenty plus years that just mm -hmm. always win their reelection. That seems like an established group of politicians to me. Yeah. If you're there for 20 plus years, you're established. Yeah, you still have to win the elections. But even then. Even then, yeah. In some of those districts that have been red or blue for the last 60 oh, years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where I, where I live, uh, it's been, it's soured red. There's like a thousand plus Republicans that show up to vote and like 400 Democrats. Yeah. I don't know if that's like the amount of people that there are or the Democratic Party needs to mobilize more, but that's just how it is in some districts. Yeah, there, there. Are, I know there are districts up in New England that have been solid blue for the last 60 plus years, and then there are those districts down in Texas that have been red for the last 60 plus years, and if you're running in that district, you don't really have to do a whole lot to win. You just have to win 51%. Sometimes you don't even have to win that much. Mm-hmm. You can, it's just, it's crazy. And then, and then you just get in and then you're there. Yeah. And I, I forget what the exact percentage is, but the amount of, the amount of incumbents that are just automatically, like almost like guaranteed their win on reelection is so high. I, I wouldn't doubt that. It's, it's just crazy high. Yeah. And so speaking, since we're on the topic of congressmen, <laughs> Did you did you follow the Speaker of the House election at Eight all? Eight times was I not? I, I, well, no, it wasn't it's like seventeen times, right? I think it was. I think they voted a total of fourteen times, and McCarthy got it on the fourteenth. Now I'm confused. Was like McCarthy like the far right of uh, like candidate for like the Republicans in that election? Were the far right people thinking that he wasn't far right enough? Um. Well, I don't want to say anything about that. I know that there were some Republicans that weren't voting for him. I think the MAGA people don't like him. Probably, because I know Trump endorsed him. That's basically all I know, is that Trump wanted him speaker. Yeah, so I, I don't actually remember what... So I, I know that he's just like the Republican. Yeah. He's like their lead guy. He's, he was the minority leader when uh, the yeah. Democrats controlled the House last year. And then he was going for Speaker of the House. And yeah, which, which usually happens. Usually when the, minor, the minority leader goes for the majority position when the party wins the seats yeah. in the House. And I don't know, it was just so funny to me because I can just imagine little Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. like walking around all of his colleagues begging for them to vote for him in mm -hmm. the popularity contest. Yeah, I, I hear they had to make some concessions. I didn't know what they were. But. I don't know either. But... I think after I think if I would lose a third time in a row, mm -hmm. I I'd be so embarrassed. Yeah. That I would just leave. I think. I think I'd be gone. I mean, for the good of the party, it might. I, I think that's a signal that the party's gonna split. I mean, I expect both parties to split sometime soon. But oh yeah. Seeing the the thing with the speaker makes me think the Republican Party might split just a hair sooner than the Democratic Party. Not too much though. Yeah. So so do you think that? Something that might split the Republican Party is if if Trump 
yes. runs? There's going to be, this is how I predict it playing out. There's going to be the traditional Republicans, the ones that want to rally behind, say, Mike Pence mm-hmm. or, uh, who's another moderate Republican? Or moderate like Republicans, right? And there's there's gonna be the ones that wanna rally behind Donald Trump, Marjorie mm-hmm. Taylor Greene, and the yeah extreme right, and that's gonna split the party. That's gonna well, cause pe- cause people people shift. People talked about Trump running as a third party for he might he might do what Roosevelt did. Teddy Roosevelt did in the early 1900s, create his own third party, try and run. But th- that isn't there has not been a high track record of success. I think the most With was third in like the nineties, someone from like the Green Party. No, independent. Yeah. Got so enough. Trump could do what Bernie did and he could be yeah. independent, but he could run through the Republican primary. Yeah. Well, I know in like the ninety two election, I'm pretty sure. Like the third party candidate was so popular that they had a, they had to debate with Bush, Clinton, and, and the third candidate, who I can't remember what his name was. That's what we almost had in 2016, too, mm-hmm. which is so funny. I think he was from the Green Party. He was either from the Green Party or he was, or he was running as an independent. Gotcha. Well, he got like 1% of the vote in the overall election, mm-hmm. which, I mean, isn't a lot, but it's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. Yeah, in a country of 300 million people. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So what do you think splits the Democratic Party, then? Uh, I would say uh, the traditional... Uh, like Roosevelt type Democrats, Clinton type Democrats of like uh, Biden and mm-hmm. uh, like I don't think Biden's as liberal as like some of the people in the media make him seem like he's he's pretty moderate. Yeah, him and Obama are pretty moderate, but uh, I think it's going to be split between those type of Democrats and Democrats like uh, AOC or uh, some of the more like liberal Democrats. Or maybe more leftist, even? Yeah, leftist, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. The it far seems right like... and the far left are going to cause a shift in both parties. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's sort of been... And I, I, so that that's your prediction you've made. Yes. I would just want to let you know, I made so many predictions on this podcast, two of the episodes which never aired because of production issues. <laughs> I made so many predictions about the midterm elections last November, mm-hmm. and every single one of them were wrong. <laughs> because everyone was talking about this big old red wave that was going to happen. I knew the red wave wasn't going to happen. And I, I don't, I just kind of thought that like maybe it was going to happen a little bit. I felt like it was going to be more of a puddle, which it kind of was. <laughs> it was. That's what I referred to. A, it was a red a, puddle. It was a red puddle. It was a red, like a drizzle. And the thing that sucks for the Republican Party is they won a couple of seats on the national level, but they lost a lot at the local level. Oh yeah, they lost a ton. It was they underperformed massively. People underrate the lo- the power of the local level. Yeah, because that's where all the stuff's implemented. Yeah, that's where all the stuff happens. Yeah, mm-hmm. local governments. I always have well, I've not always, but I've felt for like a while that local government's the most important one. That's where all the focus should be. The way republicanism works, and by republicanism I mean like representative doc- democracy. I'm not talking about like Republicans. Right. Is the government works from like the bottom up. Gotcha. Basically. Yeah. Not from the top down. Do you think that that's... Because I, I've always thought, like, it doesn't... Why would we care in Pittsburgh about a policy that's going to be implemented over in, like, Washington State at the national level? Because for us, it might not work the way it will work for them. Um, that's a good question. Well, probably because they... Uh... Well, it depends. Like, do you have like a specific example of a policy that would be implemented? No, I, I was just making a general statement. Like, I, I just I think that at the national level, because it's it's fifty states and we're one country, yes. but the fifty states are also different from each other. Yes, and the lifestyles and the culture are so different. Mm-hmm. Like, the culture of New England is vastly different from the culture of the South. Yes. So, if you were going to try to implement a policy at the federal level, it's going to be tougher to make that please everybody than put more focus at the local level mm-hmm. where you could cater to the needs of those individual like cultures in the states mm-hmm. i think that's unfortunately why not a lot of stuff gets passed in congress yeah because because no one can be happy with it because everyone is living a different life and ideally people are supposed to be arguing like uh, your representative is supposed to be arguing for like your district or your state 
But instead, half the time, they're, this goes for both sides, they're arguing for what their party wants. Yeah, and they're arguing for the corporations that The corporations and the two party, bo- the party bosses of both parties basically run this country. Yeah. Well, that's what, well that, I think that's what something that was so glaringly obvious in 2016 was that the country was ready to serve us a Clinton versus a Bush mm-hmm. again. And it was there, the, that was, if you'd consider that there is an oligarchy in this country, oh, yeah. which I consider there probably is. There is. Yeah, there, there, there are, and they, and they weren't even, they weren't even trying to hide it anymore. Mm-hmm. It was just so obvious that they weren't ready to give us choices. Yeah, it was these two families, who you could argue are crime families, <laughs> that are just vying for the control of the country every four years. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's <clears throat> one of the big reasons why Trump won is because he came in and he was this, you know, new money, vulgar, like billionaire guy that didn't play the game. Well, he played the game, but he's, um, I'm going to take something that like, uh, I mean, comedian Dave Chappelle said it, but he said it like very seriously. And I feel like it was true. He said Trump, the uh, he said I cheated the system basically, oh, yeah. and yeah. I'm gonna do it again. <laughs> that was one of the that was one of the craziest moments. He was like, Anderson Cooper was like, Mr. Trump, if you claim that the system is rigged, uh, please tell us how. And Trump goes, I know the system is rigged because I use it. I don't think people have heard that before, though. They've they've always they've been used to the politicians like lying to them. Yeah, exactly. Trump's what we call in the political science is a despot. He. A despot, uh, I think, yeah, something like that, yeah. I, th- I don't think I used the correct term, but it's something like that. He, like, makes everyone feel like that they're going to be heard or whatnot. Yeah, I definitely used the wrong term. I don't want to get sued by Trump if he's listening to this. <laughs> he listens to this podcast every week. We know but that It's like does. a term where, like, I forgot what it was. I learned it my freshman year. But it's like you make ev- everyone, like, think that you're going to, you're like this great leader and like you're very good at like doing like speeches or whatnot or getting everyone like motivated but you don't do you like abuse your power or whatnot and, and basically then, and act then, like a king and then after all that when he is like farewell speech at the end he was like hey have a good life and then he walked away like that was that was the most trump thing he's ever said because to me that seemed like he was saying i'm never going to think about any of you people ever again other than how i can get use you to get more attention and airtime. Well, I think originally Trump wanted to, uh, I don't think Trump initially thought he was going to win. I think he wanted to run. He wanted the publicity. Yeah. Um, I read uh, in a book I read, I think it was the, uh, what's the book that was very controversial that Trump didn't like that was written? But the person said that like Trump wanted like uh, his own TV network. Oh, wasn't it like written by like his niece or something like that? No, I don't know. I thought it was someone in his family that wrote a oh, book Fire about him. Oh, Fire and Fury, that's what it was. I read it in. Um, the author said that Trump wanted to uh, claim that Trump wanted to create his own TV network. And I don't know if that's true or not, but if he did, running for president would certainly get you a lot of attention. A lot oh, of yeah. Well, he, I, th- I think that was like, he said he wanted his own, but well, then he made his own social media, which didn't really work out. Mm-hmm. And then he... Well, so no, so he jumped onto Parler for a little bit, I think, and then mm-hmm. Parler got taken down. Mm-hmm. Didn't they let him back on Twitter? He is back on Twitter. He's not using his account, he's, yeah, but he's it's not been, using it but it's been reinstated. Flamed, yeah. Yeah. His, his, his first tweet back should have been like, I have three words to say. No, I have two words to say. I am back. <laughs> it was that. I'm back. I think that was the Michael something. Jordan thing. <laughs> no, I, thought that, and I think that was also something Joe Biden said. Biden was like, I have three words to say. And then he said two words. And it wasn't even like. <laughs> no, seriously. I, I wanted him to tweet so bad whenever he got reinstated. Mm, yeah. Because there are so many. There is such a. There is so much potential for a really funny tweet. Oh, yeah. Whenever he came back. But he didn't use it. And I'm kind of upset. At the time, you were either offended or you were laughing. Oh, his his Twitter was just a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. I looked through it one time, 
and he said some genuinely wild stuff. Uh-huh. And then the next tweet, still to this day, my favorite tweet that he ever made was the tweet right when the Clemson Tigers won the national championship. Yeah. And they came to the White House during the shutdown. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah, there were no the cooks, and he served them fast food. <laughs> It's I my mean, favorite Trump tweet of all that's time. That's literally a Trump thing to do, though. He, eat, he He's notorious for eating, like, McDonald's or whatnot. He, eats he, like, be, he believes that someone's going to poison his food. He gets paranoid that someone's going to poison his food, so he knows that the burgers at McDonald's are already pre-made. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, seriously. I, it, what was it, like, <clears throat> some YouTube channel. It was, like, Vice or something like that. They, like, well, they ate, like, Donald Trump for a day. <clears throat> they basically and, did. And lunch was, like, Three Diet Cokes, two Big Macs, three large fries, something crazy like that. That was like every meal. There was like there was like Big Macs in between meals. It's like, like super size me. Yeah, no, seriously, it was crazy. But I didn't know. So is that why he eats fast food? Because he thought someone was gonna poison his food? That's what I read in Fire and Fury. <laughs> but I don't. A lot of conservatives don't like that book. So. Uh huh. Oh my, yo, Gavin, can we put this yeah, in? I'll yeah. yeah, okay, folks. But I do I do know he's notorious for liking fast food though. <laughs> this is my favorite picture. This is my favorite Trump picture. The only one that's funnier than this one is when he took the picture with the team. <laughs> he's doing this. Yeah, it's the highlight of his presidency. He's just taking the picture with all like the fast food in the background. <laughs> it's the funniest. Listen, I uh, to be honest, I really wasn't what year was this, Gavin? I think it was 2018. Know, was it 2018? That was a crazy year. Clemson won, in, 20, Clemson won year. in 2018. I'm Clemson so that fan, was so. so that was my sophomore year of high school, I believe. Gavin, that was our soft. Yeah, because 2020 was our senior year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're in the same. So yeah, you're I, wasn't, I wasn't politically conscious back then. Mm-hmm. The end of my senior year is when I sort of became politically conscious. Yeah. If I would have been more aware of what was going on whenever that happened... I would have been laughing for like an entire week mm-hmm. or more. I still laugh at that picture. It's oh, yeah. the funniest thing to it me. It is. When he's doing this in front of all like his whole spread, it's a huge. That's basically his autobiography <laughs> right there, that picture. Oh, man. No, that one got me good. I still go back and look up that tweet sometimes just mm-hmm. because it's, it's hysterical. It's my favorite tweet ever. And then what was even funnier about that is after that tweet happened, Ben Shapiro had a birthday party for him. Like, they had his birthday party at the Daily Wire. And as a joke, they ordered a bunch of fast food, and he replicated the picture. And he took a caption that was like, he took it over the top. He was like, 760,000 hamburgers ordered, and it was all gone in five minutes. (laughs) Something like that, like, recreated the tweet. Yeah. It's so good. But, yeah, so I don't... I, see, I, I was really thinking that I did not expect his party to turn on him so quick well, during I, the midterms. I didn't see that coming, but then as soon as it happened, it happened. It a was lot very of, quick. A lot of people in Congress felt like Democrats and Republicans felt like a lot of like attacked by the January 6th insurrection. I think that was the breaking point. For a lot of people? For a lot of people. I think the Republicans, like... They, at that point, they accepted that like they'd lost the election. Trump was really the only one that was real. I mean, there were some people in the House. That, that's why it went so long before yeah. like, they stormed the Capitol because people in the House were uh, disputing the results. Well, yeah, because well, last night, Gavin and I watched that Andrew Callahan documentary on HBO, and it's all about, like, he, it was all about him documenting the whole Stop the Steal stuff. It's ironic. And all in some of the states, rallies. he wanted to stop the count, but in other states, <clears throat> keep it was going. totally fine. Yeah, yeah, it was totally fine. If he won, you don't need to recount them. Yeah, but if he lost, got well, to recount. I, he those said folks. two years ago, before even Biden put his hat in the ring, before anyone put their hat in the ring, if the Democrats win the White House, it's rigged. That's when I knew in 2024 he's going to try and do something like this. Yeah, of course. Yeah, he's going to run again. Not 2024, in 2020. It's like 2018 oh, that, he had that yeah. he had that tweet. Like, if the Democrats win the White House in 2020, it's rigged. And then and then the whole party just turned on him. Well, not the whole party, but the major- oh, a lot of people did. A lot of people don't a want lot, him A lot of anymore. people, because, yeah, I think January 6th was the breaking point because it was literally an attack on the Capitol. It's, 
I refer to, I see it as like my generation is 9-11. Like I wasn't alive during 9-11. Mm -hmm. I see January 6th as like people my age is 9-11. Do you think that it was, because I, I, I hear some people call it an insurrection and I hear some people call it a riot. <clears throat> it's an insurrection. They tried to overthrow the government. Because I, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. However, you saw a lot of people that broke in, they got inside, and then they just started stealing shit and like walking out. Mm -hmm. Like there it was might no. Have been a little bit of both, but it does legally qualify as an insurrection. No, I, illegally it does, yeah. But I'm thinking like, what was, like, they didn't have a plan once they got in there. Well, I mean, some of them didn't. Some of them were, it came from like Montana or whatnot. We're gonna right. overthrow the government, we're gonna install Trump as president. We're going to install yeah. this person as vice president because we can't trust Pence because apparently they were under the false impression that the vice president could change the election results. Yeah, I don't know where I that like came what Pence from. said. That's the one thing I liked about Pence's uh, vice presidency is that he said that the Constitution doesn't give him the power to, uh, he like basically kept it real. Because it well, doesn't. Yeah, the Constitution have. doesn't give, yeah. give him the power to do that. And I don't know who told them that, that he could. But they were very convinced. Well, Trump was trying to like <clears throat> was trying to create that uh, account that that, that, uh, they, that Pence could just. Well, yeah, he, Trump was saying that in his tweets. They uh, yeah in his second uh, impeachment trial, I watched that impeachment trial. They uh, showcased that numerous times that Trump was tweeting out Pence can overturn the election. Right. And that's the nowhere in the got, He can send it back to the states or something like that, which can't happen. The Constitution does not allow for that to happen. Yeah, that would be crazy if that was a rule. It's probably a good idea that that's not in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's because, uh, to be honest, I, I don't know if I would consider it. I consider it to be a very serious thing that happened. I don't know. I guess I just don't consider it to be the same. I don't know if I would call it our generation's 9 11. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But it was definitely a serious thing that happened. I just don't know if I would. But, uh, but, uh, but to be honest, I don't know why I wouldn't call it that. I mean, I just recall it, like, how people recall 9-11. I remember where I was right. that day. I remember what I was doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, in, in that regard, absolutely agree. Because I remember what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I remember the next morning. I feel like that was more of an attack on a democracy. And this might offend some people that were alive during 9-11. I apologize for that, the 9-11 itself. Because it was people, it was Americans that were attacking our own government. It wasn't. It, yeah. was, it wasn't a foreign entity. Like it, it wasn't like eleven Saudis and a couple of Egyptians. Like it was during nine eleven. Yeah, it was. These, us. these were American citizens that yeah. were storming their own capital and trying to overthrow their own government. Yeah, and what's crazy to me too is that these people went to they like did all that for Trump because they were going to reinstate him, mm -hmm. and then at the end of it all, he just left them out to dry. He, did, like he just didn't yeah. care at all. He just didn't. He, that's the thing. Like when he said, like, have a good life at the end. Mm -hmm. That was really it. Cause he was like, I don't care about any of you people. I just needed you to go in there to reaffirm in my brain this lie that I've been telling people <laughs> for the last year, however mm -hmm. long it was. Because yeah. those people, I mean, how many people, they, they've, I think they're still investigating. Oh, yeah. And arresting still, people. Yeah. I mean, I think like, a couple people have already been convicted of sedition. I would go, I don't know if like they have a legal basis for it, but from what I see, I wouldn't, I think they should go for treason. They should go for treason? Tre trying, like, trying to overthrow the government, I think it's treason. Yeah, so do you think they're going to get Trump on any of that stuff, or do you think he's I don't think, just... I don't know. It's mainly, it's kind of like the mob, all right? Like, he tells someone to do something, they tell someone else to do something, mm -hmm. and yeah. And it never gets back to him. Yeah. Trump kind of ran, like, his presidency is kind of like the mob or kind of like a, a kid. A, a, like, like, like a business almost. Like it was well, a, yeah. Like he was the mafia was, Don running the whole operation. Yeah. That's, yeah, cause I always hear people saying, like, oh, don't worry, he's not going to run in 24 because they're going to get him. I don't think they're going to get him. I just can't. Because if they haven't got him already, are they going to get him now? They might. I don't know. After that's what I'm worried about. Because well, not, they could if they wanted to. If he if he wins in 2024, it's gone. You can't. That's why we have impeachment because you can't indict a sitting president. 
Right. But you can indict someone who's not president. That's why we have impeachment. Impeachment right. doesn't put you in prison. Impeachment only gets you out of office. Right. That's so just the charges. So, right. But I'm just I'm just thinking like I, I don't think they're gonna get him. Yeah. And not that I don't want them to, mm-hmm. but because they've been saying this for years. It's like, too oh, politicized. Don't, it's too don't, politicized. Don't worry. He did X, Y, Z thing, and for sure they're going to get him this time. And they never get him. They never got him on anything. Mm-hmm. And, and now that's also because he refused to turn over evidence, and he was... He's hiding documents. He's hiding documents and all this stuff. He's a wild dude. Well, of course, Biden is <clears throat> innocent either, so... Yeah, Biden had documents too, but... <laughs> So well, the Republicans got to decide if they want to see, keep calling Biden like the senile person if he's hiding all these documents. So that's what that's what I was curious. Of. Did he know they were there? Yeah, the Republicans. <laughs> if the Republicans claim that Biden's this senile old man, how would he be smart enough to hide all these documents? Well, so, uh, I think he. I didn't, well, the ones in the office, you justify that they were there. I think. So did, did you did you look into this? Because I looked I into I this like I a little really bit. I didn't really look into it with much. I mean. But so I heard that they were in a, they were not like at the White House. They were, they were at some place where he was when he was vice president. Yeah, where like the vice president lives and works. Right. And there were documents there. But then they also, didn't they also find some in his Delaware home, his Delaware residence? Oh, I didn't hear about that. But that's different than if it was in the White, the yeah, vice president's yeah. like office area. I thought I heard that they found, although Merrick Garland, the attorney general, is actually handling it very well. Unlike the previous administration, the attorney general actually like, investigates no matter what side right well that's good yeah and Merrick Garland in my opinion should be already be on the Supreme Court but you know oh can he well he does he have all right all right so in 2015 Scalia died yeah early early 2016 Scalia died now this was still in the Obama administration and uh, he wanted to appoint uh justice to the Supreme Court this is in like February Mm mm-hmm Republicans had control of the Senate. They were like, nah, we'll wait until November. We'll put someone in at the election. Uh huh. Trump wins office. Gorch is put in. Yeah. Merrick Garland doesn't become Supreme Court justice. Then, skip to 2018. Uh-huh. Ginsburg dies in September. Yeah. And Democrats did the same thing. When, yeah. No, probably. Republicans are like they put, got, they put, no, Republicans they put are ACB like, right. Yeah, Republicans are like we gotta get someone in now immediately. Yeah. And then they did. Yeah. So they didn't. They didn't wait till the. Yeah. Well, they played the long game with the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. They knew what they were they doing. They did. Yeah. They knew what. They, I mean, I didn't like anything that recently happened involving the Supreme Court with Roe v. Wade, yeah. but they knew what they were doing. Yeah. They, they played. They, they played the they, long they, game. With they that played one. that. That was their goal. That was one of the reasons Trump got elected as well. He promised that. That was one of his campaign promises in 2016 that he was going to over. He was going to put justices just on, the, on Supreme the Supreme Court. Court that would overturn Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And it w- took a little longer than him being in office, but. That's how you. That's how you play the Supreme Court sometimes. That's yeah. Kind of, it kind of sucks, but I feel like, in time, it will be corrected. Right. Um, segregation was affirmed by the Supreme Court. Plessy versus Ferguson mm-hmm. took almost 70 years, but Brown versus the Board of Education at Topeka yeah. overturned segregation. And similar other cases following that. And I also saw about that, like, were Democrats actually in the position to codify that into law whenever... They could codify it into law because I think the Supreme Court was only protecting it based on the Ninth Amendment stating that uh, not all the amendments stated in the Constitution are federal protections. Like the right to marriage right. is uh, loving v. Virginia it is uh, mm. upheld by the 14th and Ninth Amendment. So... The government can't deny you the right to marry who you want. And then, okay. and then in 2015, the Ogilvie case affirmed that for same-sex marriage. Gotcha. Yeah, I remember that. But if they do codify it, Republicans can sue all the way up to the Supreme Court, and then they could say that the that yeah, the, it's unconstitutional for the states to do for the federal government to create a law like that. And they would do that 100. percent And then that would that would eliminate any <clears throat> codification at the federal level. The state level, they'd be able to. That's the whole. That's 
their justifiable claim for uh, overturning Roe v. Wade is the 10th Amendment, that the states have the right to determine whether or not abortion should be legal or not. Right. And I understand that, but also you know, the equipment that's used is made in another state and transported there, interstate commerce, on the scope of federal government. Oh. And what is that? Because I, I, this, is, this is an area where interstate you know commerce more than is, I do. Is the most, uh, <clears throat> usually when you create a law, you have to cite like a area. Congress can only like make a law based on like interstate commerce or like defense, like the maintaining military or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Interstate commerce is like the number one justification for laws in this country. Mm -hmm. So anything that, uh, let's say you have like a case of beer or something like that. It's an easy example. Yeah. You're driving from New York to Pennsylvania. While you're in New York, that beer is like state pro is like not under the scope of the federal government because you bought it in New York and you're still in New York. But the mm -hmm. second you cross into Pennsylvania, anything you have in the car, including that beer, is interstate commerce under the scope of the federal government. Okay. So if cross the state lines, it is in, it's under the scope of the federal government. So when you have these people traveling for abortions. And the equipment gets made in this state over here, and mm -hmm. then it gets moved. I doubt all 50 states have places where they make medical equipment. I can guarantee no. you that. No, probably not all 50. But we have to look at the numbers on that. But so, Okay, so that's interesting. So then under that <clears throat> stipulation, that would then fall back under the jurisdiction of the federal government? Yes, interstate commerce is under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Huh. I didn't know that. I never thought commerce of it like that. Of the Constitution. Huh. So then... Oh, that's interesting, because this, so then if they can't codify it... In, well, so if, they, if the Democrats codified it into law, then the Republican Party could sue... They could sue over to the Supreme all Court. All the way to the Supreme Court. But I... Maybe the Supreme Court would overturn it. Maybe I'm like overthinking the interstate commerce aspect of it a little bit. But if that does happen, I guarantee the Republic isn't going to try and sue up to the Supreme Court. Right. Well, like, I, I would not be surprised. Supreme Court. Yeah. And their justification, again, is the 10th Amendment, which states that rights not explicitly given to the 9th and 10th Amendment kind of contradict each other. Because the 9th Amendment says any rights not listed, just because the rights not listed, in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution doesn't mean it doesn't exist at the federal level. But then the okay. very next amendment says any rights not explicitly listed are granted to the states. Oh, so, no, so 9 says anything that's not listed in the Constitution doesn't... So if something's not listed in the Constitution, that, that doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it doesn't exist. Exist. Because they couldn't or obviously if it's not, fit everything. If it's not explicitly listed, it's given to the federal government. I think that's one of the reasons why judicial review exists. Right. But then 10 says anything that's not listed in the Constitution yeah, I know, goes I back know to that's, the states. I know that's exactly what 10 says. 9's kind of weird. I don't really know the exact Let me look. Word. Let me yeah. look at 9. Let me grab 9. That's actually really interesting. So that's, that's really strange. I mean, slavery was defended by the 10th Amendment for the longest time. Oh, because it was in, yeah, because going back to the states the pro-slavery Southern Democrats at the time were like, well, you can't make a federal, you can't ban slavery at the federal level because that's a right that the state has. So the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Oh, it, it gives the rights to the people. Because I think it was originally granted to the states. So that... That gives, like, the, yeah, it gives it to the people, I think. Yeah, because yeah, it says, shall, uh, um, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And then the 10th is, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Yes. Yes. Huh. So that's pretty contradictory. It is. In a way. Yeah. So does that that makes that makes codifying Roe v. Wade into law, and it's not a it's, little tricky, especially in the Senate. You still have the filibuster. Doesn't matter what party's in control. 
the minority party is just going to filibuster. And you, there's only one way to get rid of the filibuster, and that's eliminate the rule in the Senate itself. So, Okay, so I, I've, I've heard, like, both people saying, oh, we need to keep the filibuster, we need to get rid of it. Can you can you break down, like, your perspective on it, on the filibuster? Like, what I think about it or, like, what yeah. it is? Well, uh, maybe both. Okay, so the filibuster is the... Uh, you get like a lot of time to speak in the Senate or whatnot. It used to happen in the House too, but the House got rid of the filibuster. You get a lot of time to speak, and uh, after that, you're you're done. Out to the next person or whatnot. But you can like I think filibuster if it's like a specific issue. I don't know if like you have to say anything if there's some specific phrase you have to go through or whatnot. Uh huh. I think you can just. Uh, the filibuster exists you can just speak until either you're done or uh oh didn't ted didn't ted cruz do that the one time he filibustered for like 13 hours yeah, or, or they crazy. like vote down the filibuster and uh a filibuster is very important the filibuster cannot be broken by a simple majority the okay. senate changed i think it used to be but i think in 2015 the democrats in the senate changed the rule so it kind of shot themselves in the foot a little bit i'm pretty sure yeah that's usually how it happens it has to be finished by a supermajority, which is like two thirds. So you have to get like ten Republicans on board. Oh, good luck with that in to, this day and time. Uh, yeah. Good luck with to that. And the filibuster. And like usually filibusters last a long time. Politicians have historically like I'm not joking when I say this, they've worn adult diapers on the Senate floor to filibuster because they've they're going for so long. That's insane. Well, I heard didn't didn't did, like didn't Ted Cruz filibuster by like reading the rosary to his to his family like they did a whole rosary or something like that. Oh yeah, like, yeah before yeah. his kids went to bed and he's like it was like thirteen hours or something. Oh crazy yeah, and like I think that. you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so and so you you think that that needs to be scrapped? It's an archaic tool. It's like the electoral college. It's an archaic tool that was used in like the eighteenth and nineteenth century. It doesn't really apply to uh, our day and time. It basically limits any discussion that could take place. Right. And do you think that that should be replaced by something? Or do you think we just don't need anything at all? I mean, maybe you want you wean off the filibuster. Maybe you change it at first to a simple majority. Then maybe a couple of years later you get rid of it. I feel like that, even if they make it a simple majority, I feel like that's a fair compromise. Right. You're allowed to filibuster, but it can be ended by a simple majority. Okay course that would essentially eliminate it because the controlling party could just constantly shut it down shut it down that's yeah. probably why it was changed yeah that does seem like probably why it would have been changed yeah interesting because i've heard that argument go back and forth like oh we need to get rid of it we need to keep it it's necessary no it's same not with, same with the electoral college it's an archaic tool from like the 18th and 19th century that still exists in the united states and from my understanding, that's how it works, is that certain every state has a certain number of electoral college votes. Yes. If you win those electoral... If you, you win... 270. There's 270 in total. I think. I don't know if they, if it's increased because of the census, but from what I learned, it's two, the magic number is 270. You get 270 electoral votes, which... Okay. Let me just break it down. So you can't pay in all the states, and you got to win only like 51% of, you win 51% of a state, except for, I think, uh, Maine and uh, some of, there's like two states that have like a weird electoral, it's like based on representative population or something like that. But excluding those states, say Pennsylvania, that's a big state. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it increased or not because of the census or whatnot, but uh, it's, tip, it's usually been 20, so... 20 electoral votes exist in Pennsylvania. So if you win 51% of the popular vote in the state of Pennsylvania, you get all the elector all those 20 electoral votes in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So basically 49% of the population is screwed out of the one state. And you do uh -huh. that in like a bunch of other states until you get to 270. And whoever has 270 or more wins the, res wins the presidency. And, and then... The yeah. majority vote is not 
Popular vote doesn't matter. There have been like four or five times with popular vote is different from the electoral vote. Trump didn't have the popular vote, did he? He didn't. He didn't in 2016. Yeah. Hillary had the popular Hillary vote. Hillary had the popular vote. Overwhelmingly, she had like three million more voters than Trump did. But Trump won the states with more electoral yeah, college Yeah, you don't votes. have to campaign in like New York or California if you're a Republican. Hell, if you're a Democrat, you don't really have to campaign in New York or California. No, it's no. Pretty safe. They, yeah. That's the thing. So like someone who lives in New York State, they're not, they don't give, they don't give a crap about you. Right. That's why Biden won't get rid of fracking, despite him sometimes saying that he would. If he gets rid of fracking, he's going to lose a lot of votes in Pennsylvania. Yeah, That's he why is. he's extended fracking. It's political. Yeah, he wants votes. Yeah. Needs votes. It's all about the power. Yeah. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Minnesota are like some of the biggest states to win the presidential election. There's an old saying yeah. that goes, uh, "You went o- there goes Ohio, there goes the country. But, of course, last two elections, that wasn't really, you know, last election it wasn't really true because Trump won Ohio and didn't win the presidency. Right. But. Usually if you win, like, Pennsylvania, swing states is what they're called. You win the swing states, you yeah. win the presidency. Arizona's another swing state, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Texas in a couple of years might be a swing state. They got a lot of Democrats mobilizing in Texas. And a swing state happens just because there is a pretty even... People, people move from state to state. And... Yeah. Well, a lot of Californians have been moving to Texas, so that's yeah. probably a part of yeah. it. Yeah. Like, uh, Austin is predominantly Democrat, but like yeah. the rest of the state is, like, soured red. I've heard that a lot of the cities that are turning blue or purple, mm-hmm. and then the out, the out, which usually is kind of how it happens. Yeah. Right? Like, Pittsburgh's pretty purple, but you go 10 minutes, you go 10 minutes out oh, that Pittsburgh's way. Pittsburgh's pretty Democrat, though, I'm pretty sure. We have no, at least locally, they're pretty Democrat. There hasn't been a Republican mayor in Pittsburgh in, like, since, like, the 40s. Okay, so Pittsburgh's blue. Oh, yeah. But you go... Ten minutes out that way. It's red, yeah. And everyone's got MAGA merch. I'd say downtown is blue, but yeah. Everyone's got... Maybe like the... Four, a little bit more purple than downtown. Downtown's definitely... Way maybe like the whole area is yeah, like... Yeah, downtown's blue. Purple leaning towards blue, I would say. Yeah. Then the surrounding areas are probably a little more purple. Mm-hmm. And then you go... Then you get red, min- yeah. You got 15 minutes out. And you're in like a totally different. Oh yeah, it's complete. Oh, that's yeah. kind of why I love Pittsburgh so much. I love being here though, because oh, I could, because yeah. there's such a there's a, there's a nice mixing of people. I feel like. Yeah. You can go 15 minutes out there, and you're in a totally different like part of the country, essentially. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. So that's interesting. So you think Texas might become, so so that's changed. I'm guessing over the course of the country's history, certain states have become swing states, and then maybe they. Yeah, I lean think New York used to be uh, Republican. But I think that was before, like, the parties, like, switched after, like, uh, the Civil Rights Movement or whatnot. And uh, when the Democrats start, like, when Republicans start, like, be more, like, demo- traditional Democrat parties basically switch, basically. Mm-hmm. So I've heard people, that's another one I've heard people talk about. That's, like, the big switch or whatever, the big flip or whatever they call it. There wasn't really any, like, flip per se. Like, the Democrats have always campaigned. They're, like, for... They're pro like people, and the Republicans have always been pro business. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's always been. But uh, the Republican Party was founded in response to slavery. The Demo- Southern Democrats were proponents of slavery. Mm-hmm. But uh, over time, and this, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, the, uh, well, the Republican Party started like being more pro business and like screw the people, screw these labor unions. Mm-hmm. They're messing with all the profits. So uh, a Democrat swooped in, and a lot of these workers were immigrants, mm-hmm. minorities, a lot of underrepresented people at the time. Yeah. So that, I think that's where they get like their base now. And then civil rights movement, it was split within the Democratic Party. You had the Democrats that supported the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Republicans supported it, too. I mean, there were a couple of Republicans that didn't, but... I mean, yeah. there were more Republicans that didn't than any Democrats that didn't. But then you had, like, the Dixiecrats, like uh, Governor George Wallace of Alabama. He was a Democrat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I remember, like, I saw a lot of that. There was that movie about Abraham Lincoln with mm-hmm. Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah. And that's, they saw some of that stuff happening. 
mm-hmm. than like them trying to go around and like convince the people in government to vote on the 13th amendment well 13th 14th 15th amendment were kind of like i mean no disrespect to those amendments they're pretty important amendments getting rid of slavery establishing that black people could vote yeah and uh that black people were citizens and that people born here are citizens but they were kind of forced down a lot of the southern states because they weren't people forget the south the south was under military occupation at the time yeah because they burned it to the ground yes they burned it to the ground and then that military occupation you want to be back in the union you're going to ratify this this and this you're going to do this this and this and we'll let you back in right and so that kind of got forced on them because they i think that's why for a long time in the south they they resented like all that stuff they tried to create poll taxes and they well, yeah. Well, it was I mean, also out of hatred of like the Afri- unfortunately the African Americans, the racism in the South. But I think it was also out of resentment of the American government forcing those amendments on them. I mean, that would make sense because if you went to war, not that I'm <laughs> defending going to war for slavery, but if that was what you grew up with and that was your whole life, mm-hmm. and you go to war for it, and, then you, and lose, you lose, yeah, and you potentially like watch your hometown or i mean your it was the same city. way in nazi germany during, yeah. the, during the nuremberg trials a lot of uh nazi like germans were defending the or like you're ruining the glory of the right you're ruining the glory of germany yeah, to what we, they thought was like the glory of germany right i mean killing six million jews and 12 six million other people isn't really glorious at all no no definitely not but they were brainwashed to think that. Yeah. And that's, but even then, like, and then if you watched, if you were in the South during the Civil War and you watched your home get burned to the ground and completely destroyed, mm-hmm. and then these people came back and they said they were going to help you rebuild, but you had to, you had to do this, this, do this on yeah. their terms. Yeah, I mean, you definitely feel a certain type of way about that for sure. And Lincoln was never on board with that. Uh, that happened after uh, his assassination. They got more aggr- the Republican Party got more aggressive in the South. Yeah, because Lincoln had the whole like Lincoln with, wanted like a compromise. Yeah, with malice towards none and charity for all type thing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, and then I guess the same thing would have happened in Nazi Germany. Yeah, because they because they bombed Berlin to nothing. And then the British, I think, after the uh, Germans capitulated. Uh, bombed one of their cities. It wasn't Berlin. It was like another city. I think it was like Hamburg or something like that. I forget what it was. But it's I think it was, the it was after they, it was after they surrendered or something like that. Pro- in response, most likely to the Brit to the Blitz. Yeah. The uh, Germans basically pummeling London to the ground, trying to get the British to surrender. Yeah, they they they, they bombed London for a long time. Mm-hmm. For like, wasn't it like months? It was just ridiculously long. Yeah. And then, so then after Germany surrendered, in response, Britain just goes and yeah, bombs. Br- yeah, after Germany surrendered, Britain was like, well, <laughs> they bombed our civilian population, so we'll go out and bomb theirs for no reason. Uh, in the Since name they of won, revenge, they won the I war, guess. no one really can't yeah. really punish them. You no. won the war. Well, that was kind of the thing that happened in world. That was World World War One. We beat Germany, and then we punished them on top of it. I mean, we used nuclear weapons on Japan. Yeah. People don't realize that the only time nuclear weapons have been used was twice. It was during World War Two, and it was in Japan. Yeah. I mean, at least for like military. Military, military. yes, yes, in in an active military theater award. yeah yeah they've been tested they've been tested yeah countless times the french love to test them in the pacific good for them good for the french on that one well i also heard like I, this is something that i genuinely didn't know that like during world war ii the united states was doing like they were flying planes over japan dropping napalm oh yeah they were they fired bomb tokyo on on villages that were mostly made of like wood mm-hmm and that killed more people than the atomic bombs did. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Those napalm runs, which I, like, I didn't know. I've always just I. Total war. Both sides which, used it. Which is crazy, because like I, I, like, I read a lot about World War II, and I looked look into it. I mean, I didn't look at the I didn't look at the Pacific. The Pacific theater. Theater yeah. as much. 
but that's crazy to think that we were just like dropping napalm on people. And think about like the early stages of the war when uh, basically the Italians ran in with tanks and people in Ethiopia had like bows and arrows. Yeah. Or may- maybe some guns. I don't, I don't know what like definitely not enough to stop a bunch of tanks. The Ethiopians didn't also have tanks. Yeah, they didn't have tanks. That's what I'm trying to say. And they just, yeah, I mean, no, I, I, I saw a post that the comedian Neil Brennan threw up on his mm-hmm. Instagram that was talking about someone that would have been born in like the year 1900. Oh, was the, was it in response to the oldest living person dying? I think like sometime last week. Um, I don't know. It was about like some that. French nun. She was like 118 years old, lived through like two world wars, two pandemics. Yeah. It was just talking about, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was a re- response to, but Neil Brennan posted it, and it was just talking about like if you were born in 1900, and all of the different stuff that you went through mm-hmm. by the time you, you know, like if you lived to be 90, mm-hmm. you just saw so much horrible stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's And it's nuts. Like, it it was just kind of interesting because... like four or five genocides in that period of time around the world. Yeah, I mean, this post talks about, like, when you're 14, World War I starts, and then when you're 18, the Spanish flu kills, you know, like, you know, 22 million people, and then... Oh, no, World War I kills 22 million people. The Spanish flu kills 50 million people. And then there's the Great Depression... And then World War One starts. World War Two. World War sorry, World War Two starts. Seventy five million people die in that. And it just keeps going. Mm. This is the entire the entire twentieth century. Oh yeah. Was just it's not so it's it, it's interesting because it's easy like right now, you go on social media and you see all the stuff that's happening in the world, especially over in Russia and Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to think like it's all going to shit. Mm-hmm. Like it's all going downhill. It might. And it might be, but that's what those people probably thought mm-hmm. for their entire lives, going through Vietnam War, Korean War, the Cold Cuban War. Cuban Missile Crisis. Cuban Missile Crisis. That was, that was closest, uh, at least right now, until something happens with Russia, Ukraine, might happen or whatnot. U.S. Yeah. gun nuclear war. And that would be so scary, but I'm thinking, like, has, has it just always been like this? Has the world always seemed like it was going to be gone. I think after 1945, it did. Or 19, no, 1948, when the Soviets... After 1945, I don't think people thought it was, because, oh, the American government is going to protect everyone. No one has this power that they have, the, <laughs> this nuclear weapon they have. And boom, Soviet Russia is like... No, we have one. Yeah, we have one. Not only this one's we, a helium one. Not only do we have hydrogen one. Hydrogen one, yeah. Not only do we have one, we have thousands. Yeah. And then it was just who can have more of them? Mm-hmm. Who can have a bigger collection? And, and now I think at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union had like 60,000 mm-hmm. nuclear warheads, and we had 50-something thousand. We still have first strike capability, though. They, I don't think they ever had that. that I mean, that means that we can take out all like a country's defense systems or whatnot, and right. like they can't retaliate back. No other country can do that, right? As of right now, they can only retaliate if like someone except like the United States attacks them, right? But that's just it's and it's really scary. But I can't imagine what living through the twentieth century would have been like. Oh yeah, it was probably way scarier than this. Maybe yeah. Well, I mean, maybe they didn't have the access to all the information and all like this new wave of technologies just kept getting piled on. That's why I love learning about like the late eighteenth, no, late late 19th century and the early 20th century, just a massive, like, influx of technology. You go from, like, 18, like, let's say 60, like, before the Civil War, mm-hmm. life is simple. It's mainly egalitarian. Yeah. You're all you're good. Like a farmer. Boom, or Civil War hits. <laughs> After that, it starts getting more industrialized and urbanization starts occurring. Yeah. Until boom, you have all like these cities or whatnot. Uh-huh. It's just amazing to think about. 
Yeah, it is. And then all that happened in such a quick period of time. Mm -hmm. And then from... I mean, I, I would imagine World War II, like War getting out of the Great Depression, yeah. and then World War II was a big spike in technology. The reason why the United States got out of the Great Depression was because of World War II. Yeah. War brings money. And we needed to start making stuff. Yeah. Start making bullets, start making guns, yeah. tanks, armor, whatever. Yeah. It does. War brings money. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's, that's why I think all the wars in the Middle East have gone on for so long. I think that's why we were in uh -huh. Afghanistan for so long. Facts. I feel like that's why we were, one, I think that's why we went to Iraq in 2003. Yeah. Illegally, I might mind you not, the UN did not authorize to, in 1990, they authorized the intervention into Kuwait in Iraq. That was, that was legal under international law. The one in 2003 was not. And we were there for 19 years? Mm -hmm, I think. I don't know if it was 19 years or not. But... Well, because we got out of... No, that was out of, I get pulling out of that Afghanistan. That was Afghanistan. Yeah. We pulled out of Iraq, I think, during the Obama administration. But it was all We still had bases in Iraq. You know, I think we still had bases in Afghanistan. Yeah. But it was all to make money. Yeah. I mean, the, you'd be surprised how much money the industrial military complex makes a year. They make a crazy amount of money. They do. They get like ridiculously big no bid contracts from the Pentagon. I'm pretty sure they sometimes send private soldiers to the battlefield. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, most of our military is privatized. Yeah. Yet half of our public money goes to paying for all this like stuff. Like 51 percent of all tax federal tax money goes to defense. And it's privatized. Mainly, yeah. Mainly. Yeah, that's that seems a little bit. I get it. Like we have to have defenses. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. But if it's privatized, yeah, that's interesting. Huh. I mean, not all of it's privatized. No. But like, some of it is. But you, have, but you have a lot of the, you have a, a lot, lot of people the people are equipment. making money off of it, and I'm sure these people aren't just selling in the United States either. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised if they were selling to other countries. I wouldn't be surprised if they were selling to the terrorists. Like in the, remember, you ever watch Iron Man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where like uh, Tony Stark's business partner, they found out that he was selling, in addition to selling arms to like the U.S. government, he was also selling arms, he sold arms to like the terrorists that yeah. were trying to kill Tony Stark. I yeah. feel like that's what some of the military industrial complex might be doing. That would not surprise me. That would not surprise me. That would, yeah. Well, because you have so many of those big companies that have, like, third-party companies that have been given those huge contracts to make equipment. Mm -hmm. Like Northrop Grumman, mm -hmm. Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. uh, Raytheon. Mm -hmm. I think those are the big three ones. Yeah. That wouldn't surprise me if they were selling equipment to God knows who. Sell it to the highest bidder. It doesn't matter who it is. That's probably how yeah. they think. That wouldn't shock me. Not in the slightest. Okay. We got some we got some wrap up questions here at the end. We got some fun stuff. All right. All right, here we go. You ready? Yeah. What was one small act of kindness you were once shown that you will never forget? Uh -huh. I would say it was from my Zadie, my grandfather. I uh I broke, like, his glass window one time. Instead of getting mad, he just, like, explained it to me. And I felt like that was very kind or whatnot. Oh, yeah, you just, like, you just didn't. How old were you? I was, like, 10, but. Oh, okay. I yeah. just didn't get mad at, like, other stuff. I, I don't know. I was just the first thing that popped in my head. No, that, 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 that's cool, though, I mean, because you, you, you could have gotten in big trouble for that for sure. Oh, yeah. But sometimes, that's actually an interesting point that, like, uh, I'm not like the biggest fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm -hmm. but the one thing he did say is like, he let his kids, like he's okay with them like break, like if they like drop, if they like knock a glass cup off of yeah, their kids. the table, he yeah. was like, no, but that's them exploring the boundaries. That's like, they need to know you that there's a consequence tell them to that. that you, yeah. you don't do that. And right. Yeah. Especially if it was an accident, if they break something or if they make a mistake, he's like, no, like that's, like they're gonna learn from that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's cool though. That that's important though to mm -hmm. 
to especially to learn those boundaries when you're young. Yeah. So that you know that like okay, I can't like I can't knock the glass yeah. cup up. It's gonna break. Yeah. That kind of thing. Not in a physical sense, but in more of like a philosophical sense. What are you most afraid of? Philosophical sense, I would say. I'd say failure, I guess. Like, mm-hmm. definitely. Like, uh, just failure in life, like not achieving what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to go to college and law school for like a bunch of years and then end up. Because if I wanted to be a lawyer since I was like twelve, I don't want to end up like becoming a lawyer and be like, oh, this is miserable. Yeah. Uh, like, I would say that more like regret too. Yeah. Fear yeah. and regret, like. Failure and regret. I don't want to feel like a failure or anything. I don't want to. I don't want to really regret anything that I've ever done. Like I might regret like actions I do like recently. But I don't want to. I don't want to be like eighty years old and, and have, contemplate what did I do with my life. Yeah, that's a big one for sure. I feel like that's a very real fear fear for a lot of people. Absolutely, I feel like that could be a fear for every mm-hmm. single person, for sure. What thoughts keep you up at night? Um, mainly just uh, things that go on my day to day, like uh, stuff with Shalom or stuff with SGA, mm-hmm. or uh, just personal stuff. I just realized that we never touched on any SGA stuff. Hmm. Are you? Would you like to touch on SGA stuff? Well, are, are you? Are, is that okay with you? Yeah, that's okay with me. Yeah, I mean, so are are you? So you're currently the recording secretary. Yes, I am the recording secretary for the Student Government Association. Are, are you planning on making a, a run for president, or for vice president? Possibly, I'm not. Okay. At liberty at this time. No, you, you don't. You don't have to. You don't have to, to spoil anything. that here. No, I, I wouldn't put you. I, I didn't want to put you on the spot. I won't. I won't rule it out. Okay. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. I was curious. Because I'm, I'm, I, I had told you earlier before we got here, I had at least told SGA that I was interested in potentially moderating the debates. Mm-hmm. So I was curious if you'd be there at all. Uh, what's going, what's going on with that? Because there was some, there was a little bit of turbulence like with it, SGA last semester. Yeah. Has any of that been sort of brushed over or? Oh, uh, well, I feel like it's been thicked very well by uh, President Summers. I feel like she's done a very good, good job getting everything under wraps. There was a lot of. I mean, I wasn't really aware of, like, all the internal stuff. I'm still not really much aware. I mean, my job is mainly administrative, so... Right. I take the minutes, like, correct the minutes for any, like, spelling mistakes that I made, and then post them. That, right. That's basically my job. So you were so a little I, bit... So I, I really don't get to see all this, like, internal conflict that was going on. Yeah. But, like, I could tell by, like, people's tone sometimes, or people, like attitude there was internal conflict going yeah. on and it got to a point where a number of people felt tired with the conflict and decided to resign and i i understand that yeah but at the same time it also created a lot of problems with the sga because the vice president resigned mm-hmm. the, uh, the par- i'm not gonna name names but the vice president resigned the parliamentarian resigned yep and uh i think the ppt resigned too and so, are were people people were standing in for those positions, or did those people One get person. elected in? Uh, people got we uh, well the PPT was elected. Uh, Nanina Grund uh, resigned from chief of staff, and then elected PPT, and then ascended to the vice presidency. Gotcha. And then Mark Palumbo was elected as the PPT. So those two positions were filled. And Nina has been doing the job of parliamentarian since, ever since. So they never got an official parliamentarian back? Not that I know of. So Kendra might be working on it. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not at liberty. I'm not going to speak on her behalf on that. No, I wouldn't ask you to. Yeah, I wouldn't want you to. Um, and then, uh, what's the other one? Oh, vice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are all the... Uh, yeah, and then uh, Kendra like hired a bunch of people. I think we now have a DEI chair oh cool that was a position that was vacant for a long time Mm -hmm. but that's cool that's now filled yeah good uh, we hired uh chief of staff so that's one thing that uh vice president grun 
doesn't have to do yeah she's very overwhelmed yeah i mean that stuff. seems like that would be a lot I mean, to be filling two yeah. positions yeah she has a lot going on and what's the is there currently any any projects or ambitions that are sort of being shared by everyone that's being worked on um we're working on the multicultural fair we want to have another multicultural fair oh cool okay um, we're gonna be working with isla i think kendra wants to work with all like the multicultural organizations which i believe would include uh shalom okay cool um and then multi no, not, i said that and then uh pcd we're gonna have a uh, pioneer community day sometime in the future oh i like that we were working on getting that back up cool and then just a bunch of like initiatives for like students or whatnot yeah but those are like the two that are general and more campus-wide yeah that i can speak of at this time all right cool i like that well i just wanted to touch on that because i know that that's something you're you put a lot of focus into mm -hmm. uh, and i i really respect all the work that you guys are doing over there mm -hmm. okay back to these when do you feel like the best version of yourself i would say no, like uh, probably either when I'm on my radio show or when I'm hosting shout own meetings, when I'm like doing something I enjoy, when I'm passionate yeah. about something or when I enjoy doing something or SGA. Mm -hmm. like if, yeah. I'm, if I'm miserable, I'm, you're not going to get the best version of myself. <laughs> no, is, I don't. It's basically what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, th that's understandable. I, I think that that would be a thing for a lot of, I think a lot of people would say that. Mm-hmm. What do you think it takes to be a good leader? Uh, I think to be a good leader, you have to you have to know what you want to do. Mm. Um, a lot of times, I'll admit this, I don't know what to do. Mm. And sometimes I still don't know what to do, but being a good leader is figuring out what to do, maybe working with people to figure out what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Basically, come up with a plan and try and execute that plan. Yeah. I like that. And just work with others well. Yeah, that's a big one, too. You got to be willing to work with people. Mm -hmm. You can't do any of that stuff by yourself. Yeah. What gives you hope for the future? For, for you, for Point Park, and for this country? Um, I'd say people. I don't think people are as different as they think. And that goes for Point Park. That goes for university i mean people at point park they have like their differences like uh it's no it's no secret that the people in like the four other schools than copa have different views of the university than the people in copa but we all have concerns about what's going on at the university that are shared mm -hmm. like we all sometimes i i'm pretty sure i've speak for everyone by saying at times we all feel underrepresented by this university. Yeah, definitely. And underappreciated by this university. Some schools and some people, unfortunately, more than others. Yeah. And that's sad that, that has to happen. And uh, as a as a country, I feel like it's the same way. People, I feel like people are more similar than they are different. Absolutely. I, I feel like there's solidarity in this country and I feel like a lot of that solidarity is just hidden. Like, yeah, people don't really realize how connected everyone really is. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a big one. I think that we've been told that we're very different from each other in a way that we cannot be on the same side of things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's true. I mean, people are gonna have like the different opinions, and of course, whatnot, and that, that's totally fine. I mean, yeah. that's why we have free speech and free expression in this country. That's that's the beauty of it, I think. Yes, but I think people are more. I don't really think people are really. People aren't really looking at like all the numbers, like take, take inflation. People aren't really looking at oh, the second quarter, two consecutive quarters dipped. We're officially in a recession. Mm -hmm. It's all Biden's fault. I think they're just looking at, uh, well, life's a little hard right now, but we'll get through it and uh, things will get better. Yeah. 
or how can I get through this or whatnot. I think a lot of people are like, they just want to, they just live their lives and I feel like it's similar for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's so I, would, I would agree with that. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I agree. What advice do you have for young people? Um, don't give up. If you feel like unconfident or unsure in something, just just try it. I mean, if you fail, you fail. Failure helps you succeed later in life. I mean, I, I some I have. You know, the worst thing is to have regret. Yeah. I, I regret not doing SGA my freshman year. Mm -hmm. I regret a lot of things that uh, have happened and. You know, you take that, but you just move on. And you, I mean, I lost the vice presidential election, but I still, I mean, I don't really want to make this about me, but I moved on, and then yeah. I, I, like, rededicated myself to the organization. A lot of, I feel like a lot of people, if they would have lost that election, is, and I mean, I'm like, I'm going to be honest here. I lost that election pretty bad. My opponent won in a landslide. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people who would have lost in the landslide would have just left and would That's, have just, yeah. I'm done. No one wants me here. I'm out. And I, I thought about that for a little bit. I seriously did. Mm -hmm. I contemplated leaving SGA. But I was like, I ran because I'm passionate about this organization. I'm passionate about the people here at Point Park. So I, I kept going and uh, I kept working hard and I'm still in the organization today, and I don't really have any regrets about that. No, I, I don't. I think that's and failure creates success again. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very true, and I think that's respectable. That you I mean you you easily could have left. Mm -hmm. I can't say confidently that I wouldn't have left. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'll say that. Yeah. And I think it's cool that you stuck around. I like that a lot. And like. I think that is an example for other people that are going to be in SG afterwards. Mm -hmm. That even if you lose that, it doesn't matter. There's still something you can do there. They still need you. Yeah, if you're passionate, also, if you're passionate about something, it doesn't matter if like you're in SG or not, or if you went, even, even in, ge in general, if you're passionate about something, go after it. Don't, don't wait for the next guy or the next person to go after it. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do, do something, yeah. If you're passionate about it, you can basically do anything you want. Yeah, and don't within, within reason. And yeah, and, and and don't. I would also say that, like don't wait is another part of it yeah. probably too. You know, don't wait. If you want something, go for it. Mm -hmm. The the second you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you think? So you 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 you're saying you should have been in. You you should have done SGA your freshman year is what you're saying. You I wish should. you would. have. That, that might have been just a me thing reflecting on that, but I. Looking back on things, I probably I probably should have because I probably could have had more of an impact than I do now. But I mean, I take that and I'm like, what could I have done? It was mainly on Zoom the whole year. No, that's true. That was COVID. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe like one or two things, but that's about it. Yeah. But you take that with you. I take through that life, with me, and yeah. Then, and then next time you see something, an opportunity. You might join it a yeah. little earlier, and yeah. then you get that extra time. Like with my uh, Jewish club, I, I wanted to do that my like freshman or sophomore year. I was bummed out when I got to Point Park, and there was no student Jewish organization. Because like, yeah. everyone was like, oh, there's an organization for everything when you go to college. And um, I saw there was like, I think at the time, there were like two Christian organizations on campus. Yep. CCO and then some other organization. I'm not sure what the other one was. It might have not been. I don't know. But I was like all bummed out that there was no student Jewish organization. So I kept pushing that bag. Oh, well, I'm busy with like classes and stuff my freshman year, sophomore year. Oh, I'm busy with SGA. I'll do mm -hmm. it my junior year. So like after I lost the election, that's kind of that's kind of the motivation I had to start Shalom was like I like started that that summer. I yeah. was like, Well, I keep pushing this back. I'm not I'm going for it. Yeah. Because if you kept pushing it back, you may not ever have it. It happen. wouldn't have happened, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And now it is happening. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Yeah. All right. 
this one's a little deeper. This one's this one's interesting. I'm curious to see what you have about this. What is the meaning of life? Oh. And that that is a question people have been trying to answer for millions <laughs> for, of years. For a long time. Forty two <laughs> is an acceptable answer. <laughs> <laughs> um Hmm, what's the meaning of life? I'd say the meaning of life is just fulfillment. You don't want to live an empty life. Mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, you don't want to grow old or be on your deathbed and be like, I regret not doing this. And you don't want to yeah. die thinking. <clears throat> I, yeah, you don't want to be like that. Like I think about my Zadie. I mean, he passed away like 2015, 2016. Mm-hmm. He lived a full life. I mean, he, I don't think he had any regrets when he passed away. Yeah. He lived a full life. He had a family, 10 grandchildren. Wow. A f- very fulfilling life. And I, yeah. I feel like that could be, that's an example people could use. Like, if you want something in life, try and have it. And yeah. if you don't succeed, that makes you stronger for the next thing in life. Absolutely. So yeah, f- fulfillment. I would say. I, I I do think that like that grandparents a lot of times are like good examples of that. Mm-hmm. Not all the time, obviously, but yeah. like I think like my my grandfather that currently lives with us now. I think is a perfect example of that to me. Mm-hmm. Like lived a full life, like you said, and has a had a beautiful family and mm-hmm. a lot of grandkids and. Yeah, I mean that's definitely I think something that is an example to me. You don't want to leave this world unhappy. No, I don't think so. And you want, you want to, I also feel like you should feel that you've done something with your life. You contributed to society somehow, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. The, you, uh, whether that be a little contribution, like giving to charity, like one, two times or something like that, or like being like head of a charitable or cancer donor organization or something like that or just helping out in your community yeah. and you know helping out at the food bank or the something like that yeah if you can make your life better and the life around you of others better i feel like you have lived a fulfilled life absolutely i think that's a great example of that that's something that i want to do more i want to i've been thinking about like i, I want to start doing more like community work because mm-hmm. there is something to be said about improving the life of the people around you Mm-hmm. And then that, like, gets it gets reciprocated. Like, that'll come back to yeah. you and makes you feel better. That's something that I've been wanting to do. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you yeah. for sitting down with us today. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, no problem. I am excited to see what happens with Shalom. Oh, yeah. And everything's happening with SGA. Mm-hmm. Keep up the good work. Yeah. And we, I might, we may or may not see you at the SGA debates. Maybe or maybe not. Nothing's out of the question. Not ruling anything <laughs> out. No, not ruling anything out. And then if not, you'll be at SGA being the recording secretary. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Thanks, All buddy. All right, thank you. Bye, everybody.